we're going to show you how to flatten the curve, neo-peasant economic style. At Trielbo University, graphs and charts, data and statistics aren't really part of our everyday. These are things developed by uninitiated peoples. And this is the, I guess, the complex or the problem of scientific capital, where everything is reduced to measurement or chart or a reductionist um, view of the world. However, for the purposes of explaining how we need to transform our economic system from growth into um, ecological uh, cultures and ecological economies of place, because an economic system, a globalised economic system of growth, is just a horrendous simplification of people, of biomes, of the biosphere. So the simplifying and reductionist nature of gra graphs and charts and data can it, at least give us an overview for us then to be able to go in and work with the complexity of these things. With the, with the, and how these things apply to us. One of the things that I feel is missing uh, from the discussion is a kind of logical explanation of the different forms of, or the different types of footprints that are operating in the world at the moment, and also the different economic types. Uh, and what I'm writing up at the moment are the main economic types. Some of them have huge amounts of status in our media and in our popular culture, some of the type, footprint types, and some of the economic types have a huge amount of status while others are completely disappeared from view. So along the bottom of this chart, we begin with uh, ecological footprint type. That's pretty much the unrecorded or unrepresented footprint type of our culture. Then there's green tech, which is basically the desire to be ecological, but using the default narrative of technology first, relationships second. Then the IoT, Internet of Things. This is uh, the 5G revolution and the promise of a tech clean future and progress pundits like Jeremy Rivkin promote this as the share economy. I would say be very careful about uh, the spin of that. The Internet of Things is every part of life hooked up to data collecting devices. Then there's brown tech, fossil fuels, the old world that flattered the 20th century, that an extractive worldview will live forever, just hang the consequences. Unfortunately, we're still living in that paradigm to a large degree. So these are the main footprint types. We start with uh, subsistence, non-monetary, land-bonded economy. This is the economy of peasants, uh, traditional first peoples and neo-peasants, and uh, contemporary uh, first peoples as well. This is really the home and community economy. The next uh, level uh, up is the skill share. This is the trading of skills and knowledges informally as part of strengthening local economies and online communities. Then we have the artisan level, which is small scale local arts and crafts, including ceramics, uh, textiles, blacksmithing, etc. Crafts and arts that belong to a cultural context of local land. Therefore, the artisan knows where the clay comes from, has a story or a relationship to that clay or fleece or the skin. The next tier up is environmental small business. Localised small businesses operating uh, with money uh, or not, and, and or non-money. However, all... All the materials are drawing on local resources and producing no waste and some sort of relationship to those resources or waste streams if there is waste and how they are respectfully uh, become circular. The next one is local industries, 
Now this can go two ways. Um, it all depends on what it is, what the activity is, where the materials are coming from. But local industry, it, it, the best practice I think is uh, salvaging materials to repurpose or the local industry to make local renewable energy. So local industry is localized manufacturing, uh, steel fabricators, where the future is salvaging old materials for new applications. But there is also local industry uh, that moves into conventional small business. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. And conventional small business is what is often referred to as small business by governments, which is small scale monetized businesses selling um, medium or big business products. We need to be really clear in our distinctions between this type of small business, conventional small business and uh, environmental small businesses. Medium businesses are uh, businesses that employ between 20 and 200 uh, employees and currently constitutes around 25% of to total employment. And then there's big business right at the top or I've got business business for some reason. But business business is good because it's double business. Uh, 200 plus employees, approximately 30 to 35% of employment currently. Big business is involved in everything from air travel, mining, banking, entertainment, spectacles, etc. And of course, big ag, big pharma, and big energy. The current curve looks like this. Actually, that's being way too generous to the Internet of Things. The third industrial revolution requires many mined minerals, blood minerals, lithium ion, etc., from countries being devastated by the economic imperative of globalized 5G um, ideology. This curve represents many interrelated things. The explicit relationship with consumption and pollution and pop at the top there represent population explosion and popular culture because the mediatization of consumption has been championed by ad men and women. For consumption to grow, land use escalates. Non-domesticated life gets caught up in this problem. Land clearing for crops and livestock has become unprecedented since 1970. And in just 50 years since, 65% of the world's species have become extinct. COVID-19 is a result of this economic mindset. This incursion further and further into wild nature is bringing to us extreme feedback. Energy use must also aggregate in step with consumption and water as well. Domestic water use is basically 10%. Government is around 20% and industry is a staggering 70%. Large scale water permissive conventional farms and mining operations are the biggest users. Everything becomes stressed. People become stressed. More than humans become stressed. Biomes become stressed. Resources become stressed. Rivers, oceans, soils, air. Everything is stressed. The virus has given us a little bit of perspective as much as a whole lot of woes and, and pain. Neo peasants, first peoples, permaculturalists, regenerative farmers, biodynamic farmers, etc., are all drawing on past traditions and contemporary thinking to attend to the systemic problems of the current economic hegemony, which is the ideology better known as growth economics. Many of us are working towards degrowth, at least the degrowth of globalized consumption pollution streams. The most ecologically sound footprint and economic types exist in the bottom left corner of the chart. The next tier out is the middle ground between best practice economy and what Deborah Bird Rose calls man-made mass death. Sadly, it is this tier that has so much influence. All the power brokers, globally and nationally, and even in local government, serve this arena. Be it first, second or third industrial revolutions, the ideology is the same. And it's generally gender lopsided. Man can control life. Life is subject to man. 
It stems from dominion ideologies that began in various strains of monotheism, and it has spread like a virus under the religion of scientific capital. It is up to us in our homes and communities to divest from such a belief system. If we begin or continue this work, government support for business as usual will be challenged. A new culture will develop from divesting from the old world. This will bring a new era of politics, culture making and economics. The most critical thing is that biomes are central, that we become again participants in biomes, we become biomic. Our logic becomes completely in service to the biosphere. Governments will gradually begin to support ecological cultures of place if the work happens from the household and community economies outwards. Indigenous elders often ask, what's your dreaming story? Well, at the School of Applied Neo-Peasantry, it is that governments support 80% of what Tyson Yunker Porter calls custodial species. So those of us operating at a subsistence, skill share, non-monetary artisan and environmental small business level. In his incredible book, Sand Talk, Tyson Yunker Porter's chapter on industrial schooling is an incredible expose on how we live or how we got to man-made mass death in an industrial context. 20% government support for that local industry to conventional small business right up until the internet of things between green tech and the footprint type. That's very radical. We are in a serious cultural and economic state. And if we don't have clear dreaming, economic dreamings of how we can attend to our footprint and our economic types, how we can transform them into being ecological peoples of place, we are just going to continue with business as usual, as if humans are the only species worth investing in. The humans are the only uh, point of life. And of course, that just threatens our life. We know that. That 20% of support is a gradual phasing out of human-centric culture and business. And this necessitates access to land in non-capital relations. Access to land and land relationships are far more important than the internet. The internet at the moment is incredibly important for restoring uh, knowledges and for networking those of us transitioning to degrowth economies. Unfortunately, the tendency of the internet to be privatized by big business and even conventional small business and certainly medium business makes it uh, a suspect area. The Dreaming also maintains that 0% of government support for corporate welfare. And this obviously speaks for itself. We need to be aware of business as usual ideology in all aspects of footprint types and economic types. This is a consciousness raising exercise for all people wishing to transition from abusive economic dependency to ecological interdependence where returning gifts to land, water, air and non-humans has an equal place to consumption and growth. This essentially is circular economy and circular culture making. And Charles Eisenstein's book, Sacred Economics, really speaks to this. We have to wean ourselves off old economic behaviours. This takes time. It's better to go slow and gradually normalise this transition than go too fast too quickly, burn out, give up and never try it again. It is a process. We've been in our transition here at the School of Applied Neopeasantry for 12 years. To flatten the curve of growth economics, which is the greatest pathogen the world faces right now, requires reculturing. We call this neopeasant permaculture because we're second peoples reaching out to our severed ancestors who were first peoples. But you can call it whatever you like. The main thing is to degrow conventional small business, medium and large business and grow subsistence, artisan, creative local businesses responding to the land that they are custodians for. 
Decapitalizing land is a very big part of this story. And we can begin by phasing out multiple property occupancy. We can also recognize that our whole economic system is based on terra nullius, which is the theft of unceded Aboriginal land. There's so much work to be done, listening to eldership, first peoples, second peoples eldership, asking for eldership as young initiates or uninitiated people, getting initiated, becoming mentors, and eventually becoming elders. All this work is so essential. We cannot separate economy from culture. The way we do culture is our economy. The way we do economy is our culture. Well, there's Neo-Peasant Economics 101. I hope you've enjoyed it. And there's so much room for us to move um, before governments do. So obviously, Households and communities, uh, individual people, collectives, small households and groups can work really in this space and divest from, I think that's the critical thing, is divestment. Divestment from these big abusive uh, systems of power. Okay, Woody, do you want your wall back? Oh!